Yes, shalom everyone. This is Amir Tsarfati and I'm live from Galilee, from Israel. And this is our bi-weekly roundtable, prophecy roundtable. And allow me to add our regular panel participants, Pastor Barry Stagner and Jan Markel. Shalom. Good to see you. Good to see you guys. It's wonderful. We haven't met around this round table for quite a while. And um, I trust that you guys are all good. You're doing well. Doing well. Yeah. Thank Wonderful. you. Yes. Well, today we have a super, super important topic to deal with. Not that the others were not, but this one is probably going to offend some uh, people. <laughs> and I, I, I apologize in advance that uh, quite a few of the viewers uh, will maybe taking things uh, personally and uh, choose to be offended because that's a choice. But I want to tell you that uh, each one of us three is going to share his private own opinion on this topic. It doesn't mean that every specific item that we're going to say all three of us agree on, but we're, we're more or less agree on most things here. And uh, the topic today is sensationalism in, and the church in the last days. Sensationalism. Before we start, Barry and Jan, allow me to show the people the definition of sensationalism. Here it is. So, especially in journalism, but it's the use of exciting or shocking stories or language at the expense of accuracy in order to provoke public interest or excitement. So, again, we see the use of some shocking things or some things that probably we're going to talk about it, obviously, taken out of context in order. And by the way, on the expense of accuracy in order to get the effect, the wow effect. Wow. And um, I'm going to say, um, Pastor Barry, this is a plague in, in the church. Don't you think so? Absolutely. And this is something that the Bible has actually prophesied. And while it may not use the word sensationalism, both Jude and Peter in 2 Peter 2 used the phrase great swelling words. And basically what the Greek term there means is to overblow or overstate uh, a particular issue in an effort to gain benefit. And the benefit would be uh, following in this uh, media driven age that we live in. And much of what the media has been doing has crept into the church uh, because it does create uh, that atmosphere where people are, are interested. Uh, they want to hear things uh, regardless of their uh, accuracy. They want to hear things that basically do what Paul talked about in 2 Timothy chapter 4. They tickle their ears. There's things that are of interest to them, things that satisfy their curiosity, and uh, uh, basically fables have replaced fact uh, in our day. And this is a, a biblically stated uh, event that's related to the last days. Mm. And Jen, um, sensationalism, do you have any experience with seeing people that are exercising this type of sensationalism um, in the church? I'm not talking about outside of the church. I mean, this is the pure work of journalism. And, uh, you know, the media that will always make uh, uh, the little thing, the big thing. And unfortunately, the big things are being hidden. But what do you say? Well, I could go to um, <clears throat> some Christian websites right now, particularly some news websites, news and information. And you will see the most um, stunning headlines. <laughs> the, the headlines are there to, to kind of lure you in. So, you know, you click on it and things like that. Yeah, the clickbait and all, uh, all that. So, I mean, I see a lot of that. But but I, I and, and then you've got the I'm going to use the word lust for for more likes, for more views, for more numbers, to grow all your the various things that uh, the the Facebooks and the YouTubes and all of that and 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 I mean some of that is is net you want natural growth so you do things that will increase the viewership and that's fine, but when it gets to be a gimmick. I think that's a problem, and I see that. I could name the websites. I'm not going to, but I could name them that do this on a consistent basis, and they're trying to lure you in, 
And it's not that they're presenting all false stories or, or anything. They're just, they're exaggerating. And I think that's unfortunate mm -hmm. because I don't think that's genuine. Yeah. Well, you guys, when I was thinking about this topic and I, and I was trying to think, uh, okay, which direction uh, am I going to take it? And uh, I actually saw two main streams in sensationalism nowadays in the church. One that is taking things out of context in order to hasten the coming of Jesus yeah. uh, and, and to ex get people super excited and sometimes nervous. And the other one is taking a complete different approach of not to necessarily talking about scriptures, in fact, not talking about scriptures, but looking at current events only and trying to establish that the good guys are going to win eventually. Thus, we don't need to talk about the coming of Christ and we right. really don't need to uh, deal with that. And of course, Second Peter 3, 4, uh, all about uh, the fact that, um, you know, uh, you know, people are, are are saying, where is the promise of his coming? So yeah. my point is this, um, as far as I'm concerned, I, I was trying to think about, okay, what are the topics um, that I could see of people that were taking things out of context in order to hasten the coming of Jesus? And I remember uh, I wasn't, uh, you know, I, I was very, very young. I saw the turn of the millennium when I was in California studying in the School of Ministry of Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa. Um, and I remember the Y2K thing and, and how the whole body of Christ thought that it's the end and there were survival kits that were offered online and uh, people thought this is it, it's the end. Then, of course, all of us experienced and also personally, we were attacked by people who thought that the blood moons are real and that Jesus is coming right after. And and we said, no, this is something that the Bible talks about in the tribulation and they didn't want to hear about it. And then there was the Revelation 12 sign and uh, and then there was the rare sun eclipse and in all of that, there's more. I don't want to take most of the time, but I, what I'm trying to say is that people take scriptures from the book of Revelation and they make it sound like this is happening right now. Uh, Pastor Barry, what is it in the book of Revelation that we must remember that it's not for us as a church to deal with? Well, first of all, we recognize that uh, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, John, a representative and member of the church, was told to come up here. And then all of heaven, uh, all of the earth, the living and the dead were searched for one who was worthy to open uh, the seven sealed scroll in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And it was a lamb as if it had been slain who was found to be worthy. And as he begins to open the scrolls in chapter 6, verse 1, then the tribulation period is described for us in great detail and from Revelation 6 through Revelation 19, the church is completely absent as God finishes his discipline of the nation of Israel and through the tribulation period causes them to look upon the one whom they pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son as he, hmm. as he returns with the church. So, you hmm. know, the tribulation period is the 70th week of Daniel. It is the finalization of the things promised to Daniel concerning his people and his holy city, and that's the Jews in Jerusalem. Yeah. And that is the main context of Revelation. And Amir, if I could just play off of something you said a moment ago about these blood moons and all of the, you know, the cyclical things that are normal uh, course of life and uh, uh, cosmos uh, type related events. I was thinking uh, all the way back, even before the Y2K thing, in 1991, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, churches were absolutely packed and uh, people were sitting on the floor, even of our home church, people were sitting in the aisles on the floor. And I remember thinking back then, because everybody's mind was on, on this is it. There's war in the Middle East. Jesus is coming. We know the Middle East and, and the return of Jesus have some kind, type of connection. And I remember thinking at that time, if something doesn't happen, what's going to be birthed out of this is an indifference to signs. And uh, mm. that's exactly what we're seeing today. Yeah. 
is the signs are all around us. It's clear, more, far more clear now. And we don't need to sensationalize anything. We just need to stay biblical that Jesus is coming soon. Yes. And uh, our attention is to be uh, lifted towards him. And that day and hour has already been appointed by the Father. Yes. And uh, we're not going to do anything to make it happen sooner. Yes. Jan. Could I, could I just yes. add something Please. to what, what Barry has said here? And and I think when we're talking about the church, and, and all of us reference uh, the New Apostolic Reformation a lot, and that's a whole big movement within the church, is that they're using sensationalism with, again, we talked about it last, with their signs and wonders. Um, and are those true signs and wonders, or are some of those maybe a little bit uh, gimmicky to get followers and to, uh, to expand their numbers too? I don't know because I'm not in a church that uses signs and wonders, but they are, uh, that whole phenomenon is just exploding mm -hmm. worldwide. That's worldwide. Yes. Now, it's very interesting, uh, a couple of years ago, maybe maybe three, four years ago, uh, I had a friend of mine in Southern California, and he said that his entire family um, was, or, you know, was into these blood moons things, and he, they, they, actually some of them were angry with me that I was, you know, strongly against that, because I said it is something of the Bible, but it's for the tribulation time. It's not for us right now to deal with. And he described to me their disappointment when nothing happened after those blood moons. I remember that. Exactly. That is exactly what Satan wants to give us false hopes. And then we are let down. And so many Christians left faith or so many people who profess yes. to be Christians, they, they thought, oh, it's not what I thought it is. I was so excited. I, I was sure God is. And all of that because scriptures were taken out of context. Yeah, out of context. And, uh, and that's what I see also. Now, I must confess that even recently, I get to see more of those things. If, if the Y2K took place 21 years ago, the blood moons and revelation signs three, four years ago, and then, uh, as of a year and a half ago, the peace accord started, and there you go, boom, once again, peace. Then it's the Antichrist, because there has to be peace and all of that. And 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 you know what? It, it, for some Christians, the word peace is a problem, because, you know, yes. it, it is Daniel chapter 9, uh, immediately, not every peace deal is uh, you know of the devil or his minions but i do also want to bring about another thing uh, the us elections i cannot even tell you how how many pastors were online on their phones telling the whole world that they just received information yes. that trump is going to declare martial law and then some others said, well, the Lord spoke to me. He is going to win. And others, look, I wanted him to win. I actually, I'm, if I was an American, I would have voted for him. But I never for a minute thought that God is the one who told me that this is going to happen. We all want biblical um, platform to obviously, or godly platform to be more, uh, you know, in government than, than the other side, which we see today. But um, let's face it, even today, don't you see that today, Jan? I mean, yes. this thing. Yep. There are still people that are saying, uh, let me just address a couple of things here. They're still saying uh, President Trump will be back in office by, oh. uh, by, by August or, or another date. That August seems to be the most popular. But there's a movement, and it is a sensational movement, <laughs> that's furthered this. I'm doing radio on it this weekend. They can... Find it on my website, oliveviews.org, and that is that is the QAnon movement. Now, I don't uh, nothing I say here is meant to be offensive, but QAnon um, is very likely the ultimate in conspiracy because QAnon's wrong all the time. We talk a little bit about today's modern day prophets being wrong all the time. Well, QAnon is wrong all the time. All the time, he's wrong because supposedly the president was supposed to be reinstalled here weeks ago, and now in the next few weeks and or the next 
anyway, all I'm saying is this is not sound. It's not biblical, but people are clinging to it because they love the uh, sort of the supernatural element to all of this. Yeah. Now, Barry, when 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 you look at uh, QAnon, you can jump into the conclusion of uh, Dominion uh, theology, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I think when you've got uh, a theology that basically determines your interpretation of Scripture instead of the other way around, uh, letting Scripture determine your theology and thus your interpretation, you find yourself having to basically sensationalize things that are happening around you in order to make your case that the world is getting better and that things are turning right. in a direction where, you know, there's manifestations of uh, apostolic age uh, type miracles and this is all preparation for, you know, the, the final seven mountain mandate where the church is going to have dominion over these different areas of uh, culture and media and government and entertainment and all these other things that it, are taught and believe. There has to show progress for that to keep people's attention. And uh, there's right. a lot of that going on. And, and Amir, you know, something I, f I found interesting, you know, when, when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, the final and the closing statements were about false teachers. Correct. And the, the interesting thing that he said in Matthew 7, 21 uh, about this group where he said, you know, not everybody who calls me Lord is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And basically what this group presented to him was things done in his name, like foretelling the future prophecy uh, as well as casting out demons and many wonders. Haven't we done all these things, these sensational things in your name? There's no mention about teaching line upon line, precept upon precept of the word, but there was a focus on sensationalism. And, and this is what they were trying to validate their ministry uh, through to the Lord himself. And then he says to them, depart from me. Uh, I never knew you. And yes. the, the mm -hmm. identif point of identification is you who practice lawlessness. And this is parallel with what Peter said and Jude said about those who were lusting after the flesh, trying to gain a following and basically creating mm -hmm. personal benefit through the sensationalizing of uh, world events and teaching to, to uh, underscore their own particular interpretation or non-interpretation of scripture. And th this is where we're at today. It coincides exactly with what Paul said about the abandonment of sound doctrine being replaced right. with fables and ear tickling teaching, uh, that is uh, an indication we're in the last days. You know, it's hilarious because I'm looking at all the comments that are running on the side, and I see people saying the rapture is sensational. Well, the rapture is biblical. biblical. Sensationalism is taking things out of context and on the expense of accuracy. I mean, making things. The rapture is super accurate, and it is found in the scriptures. I mean, we will be going to see the Lord in the air, meet Him in the clouds. It is First Thessalonians chapter four, and in First Corinthians chapter fifteen, we see that our body is going to change. These are not sensational things. We teach scriptures, and if you don't like those scriptures, you've got problems with the scriptures, not with the teacher. It's not sensationalism to talk about the rapture, it's Bible teaching to talk right. about the rapture. Uh, but to uh, to say that there is no rapture is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. Right, it's right. Exactly. Where's the promise of his coming? And then we, it's not going to come, or we need to go to... That's sensationalism, because that's when you try to make sense out of everything that's going on around the world, thinking that you can act, you, that there is no promise that is special to the church. To be exempt from all of this, we all need to go through all of that to, together. Now, you know, yeah, if, if, yeah, go ahead. You know what? I, what you said is so important because sensationalism is the exploitation of emotions and playing off of people's feelings and desires. The rapture is fact. And, you know, it is, it's sensational. I think it's sensational if it happened today, uh, but it's not sensationalizing to say that we're going to be caught away in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, it's a biblical fact. It just happens to be one that's magnificent in nature, but clearly taught. And teaching the rapture is not the exploitation of people's emotions. And as you and I in, in uh, different conferences have kind of joked 
you know, people accuse rapture believers, pre-tribulation rapture believers, as being escapists and uh, guilty as charged. I want to escape the things oh, here upon the whole world. And uh, as a matter of fact, yeah. we're to pray to be found worthy uh, to escape yeah. these things. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, what you said, I think, is so crucial because there's an exploitation element that needs to be underscored uh, regarding our topic today. And it's playing off of pe people's fears and emotions and getting them to follow after them and what they're teaching uh, as the end result. Yes. In fact, guys, while we talk, and we've got uh, seven more minutes to talk before we take questions. If you have questions that you want us to answer, please write them on the on the chat on the side. Instead of arguing with one another, uh, just write the questions you want us to uh, answer. And uh, Jason, our administrative assistant, is going to collect those questions and he will refer to us uh, in a few minutes. Jan, there's another thing that I've noticed over the last yeah. couple of years. And, and as you well said, people want, you know, followers and likes and and uh, subscribers and all of that. One of the things I noticed is that uh, some pastors decided that in order to be famous, uh, I need to be original. And, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, to be original is to not say what uh, scholars before me said, but to say that they are not scholarly enough and I know better. For example, uh, they say that uh, the fig tree that we know in the Matthew uh, 24 is not representing Israel. Uh, what else do you see that is going along the same line? Well, that, I mean, I think that's one of the primary examples um, because I was going to raise that very same thing. So, um, offhand, I can't. I, I honestly can't think of anything else that I've seen. But I, I hear what you're saying, and that is, they're departing from the traditional teaching that the Bible clearly talks about, and then they sort of come up with their own theory. And I think that's to, to, their way of saying. Um, you know, follow me because I've got better insights than anybody else. And all we all we're asking is let's have biblical insights. That's all, not sensational insights or supposedly come up with all these unique ideas. That's the one I heard you referred to is uh, the fig tree suddenly isn't Israel. And I'm thinking, my goodness, how did this how, where did this come from? Yeah. And apparently it's it's as you say. Yeah, it's very sad also that. Uh, Sometimes, in order to establish what we want to say, we take even the Greek out of context, sure. and um, and it saddens me because uh, you know, as students of the Bible, the best way to interpret the Bible is the Bible. If you don't understand what that Greek word means here, then find out where else the Bible uses that same word, and then you can easily cut, get to that conclusion. But um, uh, again, uh, I guess these are things we have to deal with. Um, well, can I just add one thing, Amir? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and that is, I think everything we're talking about, and we 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 did a couple of programs on this, but I think this is another angle of it, is a part of the great falling away, the great end time Absolutely. falling away. It just goes into that whole category, is when we're straying from sound doctrine using whatever gimmicks. Even using, I'm going to say, the, the smoke and the light shows and everything in the church, I think this is a part of, of the falling away from sound doctrine, sound preaching, and it's resorting to gimmicks, and it's resorting to uh, tickling the ears. We've already referenced that, but I think that's key here because I think sensationalism does one thing. It tickles the ears, and that's what people love to have happen. Exactly. And unfortunately... Uh, as at least in my 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 opinion, I, I don't say it's all, it's all three of us, but in my opinion, even COVID and the vaccines has been taken out of proportion and is being sensationalized more than it is. And not only that, I'm talking about, I mean, literally everything that is happening, immediately people blow it out of proportion to the point that it's a matter of salvation or not salvation. It's a matter of death or life. It's a matter of evil or good. Yeah. And we lose we lose touch of, of what the Bible defines mm -hmm. salvation and evil and all of that. Barry, do you have anything else to add to that? 
Yeah, I think what happens is we want to people want to be out of here so bad that they'll they'll do anything to force something into uh, increasing the nearness of the rapture of the church. And I think what you just pointed out is crucial uh, for our understanding because there's a lot of people today, you know, who are saying that, uh, or there's some people I should say, who are saying that the vaccine is the mark of the beast and and all these other things. And we've made the point that that's not even remotely possible. Uh, because there is no beast. Uh, the right. mark is directly associated with the rise of the beast of power. Uh, the word mark is the Greek word kragma, and it means a, a tattoo or a brand on the surface of the skin. It's placed on the hand of the forehead. And, uh, you know, the vaccine may have components that are greasing the skids uh, yeah. for the worldwide acceptance, but, you know, to take the vaccine is not accepting the mark of the beast. And, you know, I just uh, someone commented online the other day that two lifelong friends had their relationship severed because yeah. one Christian woman took the vaccine and the other Christian woman said, oh, so you decided to take the mark of the beast. And their friendship ended over somebody taking a vaccine because of their own personal health convictions. Yeah. Now, this we can have our opinions about it. We can do our own research and all those things. But, you know, this this is causing division absolutely uh, within the church and it's unnecessary. It's the biggest divider in my lifetime. This is the biggest divider in my lifetime. And yeah. it's tragic because it's hardly a salvation issue. Yeah, it's hard. I uh, uh, my in-laws just told me there's a very famous uh, uh, Christian leader in uh, in Scandinavia and he's a uh, He's against the vaccines. So people asked him, uh, so is this the mark of the beast? He says, it's not the mark of the beast, but God is watching anyone mm. who is taking it. And I'm like, uh, and I'm like, God is watching everyone all the time. It's not only those that, and it's, it's this whole type of ad, attitude is, and by the way, that man almost died of COVID uh, a mm. week later. But my point is, uh, I just think that we must remember to go back to scriptures and everything that is happening, we, we must analyze through the lens of the scriptures. And if the scriptures are not talking about a certain thing, we do not have any mandate to uh, make it up because it fits right. what we see and what we feel right now. I think we're right. done with the... The 30 minutes uh, discussion, we're going to talk more, of course, as we answer questions. But I'm going to add Jason Comins, our administrative assistant. Um, and Jason, shalom, how are you? Okay. There we go. Good. Thank you for having me. No problem. Jason, you're in Phoenix, Arizona. Jan, yes. you're in Minneapolis. Barry, you're in Southern California. And I am in Galilee, Israel. Some people told me, hey, you forgot to pray at the beginning. And that's because we, all of us, prayed a second before we started. So it may have, may have slipped my mind. But we did pray before. We will pray with all of you at the very end. Don't worry. So, Jason, I'm going to give it to you from now on. You're going to tell us and, and, and what are the questions that are relevant to the topic today and how and who needs to answer. Go ahead. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, as we as we kick this off, I feel like this is a really good question to set the tone for what we've what what the three of you have been discussing. Uh, and I'll start with you, Pastor Barry. Uh, I think we have to def we need to answer this question so that people have a context for everything else. But Carol asks, how long are do you how do you think how long are the last days? And I would add to that. When did they begin? When did the last days begin? The last days began when Jesus uh, arrived on the surface of the earth. Uh, that's what Hebrews tells us, that in time past, God spoke to the fathers through the prophets, but in these last days has spoken to us through a son. And yeah. when Jesus walked the earth, uh, the last segment of uh, history began that'll be finalized by the tribulation. You know, we have uh, just tremendous events and information described for us in scripture about what it's going to be like when the last days of the church age are wrapping up. And then we've got the 70th week of Daniel followed by the millennial reign of Christ on earth. So, you know, the last days really is a phrase that's associated with things as we know them. And, uh, 
you know, the, uh, the time frame of the milli annum, uh, the Latin phrase meaning a thousand years, uh, is kind of outside the last days uh, because it's the earth being governed as it should be and uh, ruled in righteousness by him who sits on David's throne in Jerusalem. So the last days started when Jesus came. Uh, the last days, as we understand them, uh, are going to end for the church at the rapture, and they'll end for Israel at the second coming, and then there'll be uh, the millennium uh, where Jesus rules and reigns, and that will uh, lead to the great white throne judgment and the wrapping up of things as we know them and the earth being destroyed and the elements melting away with a fervent heat and then eternity begins. Thank you, Pastor Barry. And one, one of those events you mentioned was the millennial kingdom. And someone wrote in asking, well, they stated, my friend doesn't believe in the millennial kingdom. Uh, so that's, there's one issue there, but they continued, and this person thinks that the book of Revelation is all symbolic. And they ask, is this part of the falling away? So, Amir, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, you just got done, and you've been asked this before, but you just got done answering this question uh, in an interview for a magazine. And you were asked, how would you respond to someone who says the book of Revelation is just all symbolism? It's all symbolic. Well, What's missing there? There's a key to understanding the book of Revelation. And uh, there's also, this also answers the question about the millennial kingdom being a real thing. Uh, so is this part of the falling away? And what's the absolutely. key? Absolutely. And what's the key to understanding Revelation? Jason, absolutely it's part of the falling away. When you start allegorizing everything, then it, there is no end to it. Now, the funny thing is, you allegorize that, you need to allegorize everything else because you cannot allegorize only one thing and leave all the other. I'm thinking about how many people were shocked when Israel came back to life and was established as a state in 1948 because all their theology that God forgot about Israel and that the church has replaced Israel came tumbling down. Oops, Israel right. is actually... So right. if God... Literally, not figuratively, if God literally fulfilled his promises to Israel in not just some, all, physically brought them from the four corners of the, of the world, brought them back to their land, now brought Jerusalem back to their land. He will also, the same God who cannot change and he will not change, that same God will fulfill each and every one of those things that he promised in the book of revelation in fact the book of revelation as far as i'm concerned is the single most important prophetic scriptures in the world why it is by the way the only book that we were told that we will be cursed if we add or subtract from it and it's the yeah. only book that we we are promised a blessing for those who teach and those that are are hearing it why because if it's the same Messiah, and it's the same God, and it's the same people of Israel, and it's the same world, and it's the same John. It's not different. And what and John it got a glimpse of that which thankfully he was able and instructed to share with us to give us the believers so much hope for 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 what we are not going to go through and all the necessary data to share with others so they will not go through that and god I, uh, yeah go ahead if i could just add to kind of what mm -hmm. amir is saying and to your question jason it's a really good question because honestly to be truthful most of the church today is all millennial most of the church believes that uh does not believe the way we do, that there's a literal antichrist, a literal rapture, a literal tribulation, a literal millennium. They, they believe in amillennialism, almost all of the church. And now we've got evangelical outfits such, such, such as the Evangelical Free Church of America, who has always believed as we do. And it's a wonderful denomination. I was a member for 10 years. Wonderful, solid denomination. Now they've given up the term. We are no longer going to say premillennial. 
um, our wonderful college in St. Paul, Northwestern College or Northwestern University, has now removed from their statement of faith uh, imminent and removed premillennial. All I'm saying is now evangelicalism is drifting into what, what you just suggested, Jason, into the allegorical. So this is a catastrophe. It really is a biblical catastrophe. Yes. And there was there is someone who replied who said, so they used this without using this word, this title often comes up to people, uh, gets attached to people who think like like us. They said, so if you're not dispensational, you're part of the following part of the falling away. And my I just want to uh, reiterate to that person. It has nothing to do with this title. The concern is not on how you I what what title you're identifying under what's being explained in this forum is that these are literal biblical truths and there's great danger in pulling away from those exactly uh, about the the title you're identifying yeah. with and so yeah. um did anyone else want to add to that i i wanted to say also that uh you can identify uh people that are going astray from the scriptures even by the way and unfortunately, I must say, that I see here on the on the comments, somebody just wrote, the Zionists are the new Hitlers. I saw and, that. Yeah, but my point is this, that you are a despicable anti-Semite to say that, and you are not even a Christian. If you hate that which God loves, then I don't think you know Jesus. I don't think you know Jesus, and you've got a problem, not just with Israel, you've got a problem with a Jewish Messiah that said to in John chapter 4, verse 22, salvation is of the Jews. You've got a problem with that as well. You've got a problem with everything that the Bible has to say. And my point is this. The book of Revelation, but not only the book of Revelation, everything that we see in the scriptures, either you see the spirit of God that is working in you and he's changing you to be more like Jesus, or you don't know the Spirit of God, and you put your spirit of hatred and anger, and you I mean, literally spit that uh, all over, all around. You know, this morning I heard a sermon on how to be like, to be, to be more like the image of Jesus. And it was amazing because Think about it. When God created Adam, he was in his image. In the image of God, he created him. And sin destroyed it. And we are no longer in the image of God, unfortunately, only by having Jesus coming back or coming to this world. Excuse me. We can see. We can see God in, obviously, Jesus. And now, after believing in him, we can now be uh, conforming to his image and we're going back only through faith in him there has to be a, an amazing journey that we make from the fallen state all the way back to be in, to, to be like him to liken to his image and for that you need the renewal of your mind mm -hmm. you need that spiritual regeneration and when you only have hatred and anger there is no Jesus in it. You are just not following him. You don't know him even. And, and the book of Revelation, it, it may sound and look harsh, but actually it's a love letter of Jesus to the church, if you really think about it. Because Jesus is telling us, look at what is going to happen to this world because of what mankind is doing. And look at what I'm going to do with you while all of this is going to happen. I think it's the most amazing thing. We get a piece of information of what this world is going to look like. And we know we are exempt from it only because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, yeah. not because of anything we did. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Jan, I think this is a this is an important question to answer as well. And. Uh, I think Deborah is really looking for balance when she asks this, be, trying to separate sensationalism from uh, uh, honest integrity to the word. And she asks, is it sensational to 
to keep track of or observe the signs of his return? Uh, is that a sensational thing to do to see things um, going on and observe the times and the seasons? Oh, uh, I think we, I, I think to keep our mental sanity today, we need to be looking at the signs. Um, the, the, the Pharisees were, were scolded because they rejected the signs of Jesus first coming. And that's a pretty blunt way of saying, Hey church, pay attention to the signs of my return and my second coming. I'm so I encourage people, we are in such dark times and they're not going to get better folks. I'm sorry. They're not going to get better. So look for his coming. That's why we do that. That's why we're in ministry is to encourage you that Jesus is coming again and soon. And we can know that by aligning some of the things that are happening, the rise of lawlessness. I'm in Minneapolis and again, they're rioting in my city, but that's a sign, a herald of his coming. So, you know, be encouraged. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, kind of circling back to the, the topic of prophecy in a whole and not just what's being believed on the individual level, but also what's being taught from the pulpit. And uh, Pastor Barry, I'll circle back to you. Uh, Joey asks, some churches don't teach prophecy. Is this a salvation issue? And depending on how you answer that, uh, whether it is or it isn't, what are the concerns regardless? Well, I think it leaves people ill-equipped. You know, we're saved by the blood of Jesus and our trust and faith in him. And, uh, you know, I, I think I always like to say when people ask me questions about uh, a person's position on the rapture, you know, what about the mid-tribber? What about the post-tribber? I always say, well, I think they're in for a very pleasant surprise. Uh, we're going to be out of here before any of this stuff starts. But uh, And I think they'll go too. I don't think that your eschatological position determines your salvation. And uh, as Amir was pointing out a moment ago, there are certain things that are going to be our own personal convictions and, um, you know, as he was alluding to, you know, among those things are the, the support of the nation of Israel as we see Bible prophecy being fulfilled. And it, it, this is, if there's one thing that I think is the most common statement uh, among the two that we hear as uh, we travel around the world, and that is, I can't find a church that teaches the Bible, and I can't find a pastor that teaches prophecy. And these are basically to the detriment of the people sitting in the pew uh, because one, they need the word of God, which does not return void, taught here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. And also we need to be making sure that we're covering the whole of the counsel of God, including the 27% that is related to Bible prophecy. And you know, Amir alluded to earlier, Revelation chapter one, verse three, about the blessing associated with the one who uh, reads and hears and keeps the words of this prophecy. And that word uh, keep is a Greek term, tereo, and it means to guard from loss or injury. And therefore we don't lose track of what's uh, happening. And, and as the question that you posed to Jan is so important as well. Yeah, we need to be keeping track. We need to be uh, examining the evidence around us and what is valid and what is not. We need to be good Bereans when interpreting prophecy and, um, you know, if you're going to teach the whole Bible, one quarter of the time, you're going to be dealing with the subject of prophecy, whether it's related to the first or the second coming of Jesus. Uh, and again, that's what keeps uh, us looking up. Yeah. And it keeps our eyes above mm -hmm. the circumstances of life and the expectation of the glorious hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So very, very critical I don't think that I would go as far to say that uh, not teaching uh, Bible prophecy is a salvation issue. Uh, I think it just leaves people unready. Yeah. And reason, when a Bible wants to tell us that something is allegoric, that it's a parable, the Bible says this is a parable. Right. I mean, you don't right. have to you know, wonder. I mean, Jesus spoke with, in parables many times, but whenever he mentioned names, then it wasn't a parable. He spoke about specific people, specific things. And uh, and whenever you talk about uh, great events such as the ones we hear about, um, yes, they're going to happen. They're going to happen. And and we are watching the world moving that direction. We, it, 
I, I think that the book of Revelation, if anything, the last year and a half taught us is that the book of Revelation should be taken very seriously. Uh, I mean, it's not, it is definitely something that is around the corner. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so building off of that question, someone asked, so how do we respond? Like, if do we leave our church if they're not holding to these biblical truths and maybe even not, maybe not even just not teaching them, but denying these biblical truths? Is it time to look elsewhere? Uh, Jan, yes. what would you say to this person? Yes. And I get that email many times a day. And mm. it's, it's from all over America, but it's from all over the world. I mean, I hear from Europe, I hear from Australia, and they're so looking for um, a sound teaching biblical pulpit. They would, nobody's saying, you know, you've got to teach eschatology every Sunday. No one's saying that. But, but right. could we hear it? Could we hear it occasionally? Could we have a conference perhaps? If it's appropriate in the context of a message, could you bring in the fact that Jesus is coming very soon? But by and large, what I'm deducing is about 90% of our pulpits will not go there for one reason or another. I think we may have talked about it in previous programs. This is the shame of my lifetime that things have gone from, we're talking about it very frequently, to, well, now and then, to never, never. And Barry Stagner, you have better insight as a pastor than I just get the fallout. I mean, you're talking to pastors regularly. I think you should address this. Yeah, it is, uh, again, the big question. And Jan, like you, I get the same question asked all the time. And, you know, uh, Jason, I think the important uh, element to first establish is what you said at the outset in the framing of the question. And that is, uh, there's a large, there's a huge difference between not teaching the truth and uh, not teaching, uh, you know, eschatology or whatever, you know, because when you've got someone that's abandoned the truth and uh, is teaching heresy, uh, that's one thing. Uh, when you've got someone that's intimidated by teaching prophecy and is not, you know, there's tons of churches that have never cracked Daniel or the book of Revelation, or nor have they studied Ezekiel 38 and 39 because they're intimidated by it. And again, they're you know, they're basically ripping off the congregation, so to speak. But, right. you know, the soundness of their teaching on the, the salvation issues is there. And my counsel to people who are in that situation where their their pastor loves Jesus, their pastor is rightly dividing the word of truth as he teaches it, but he's avoiding certain topics either because he feels ill-equipped or doesn't uh, understand them fully himself or doesn't want to get caught in the vortex of all the things that happen to Bible prophecy teachers, I would say to them, listen, if your pastor is right on with the doctrine of salvation and he's rightly dividing the word of truth, then I don't think you need to shake the dust off your feet and leave that church. Yeah. Uh, but if your pastor's teaching heretical things, if it's an anti-Semitic, which would include replacement theology church, get out yeah. of there and get out of there yesterday uh, because everything else is gonna be under suspicion. Because, you know, as we've talked about, the book of Revelation is written to and about the Jews. And, you know, if you've departed from the Jews and their role uh, within the, uh, the redemptive plan of God, yeah. then everything else you teach is suspicious yeah. as well. So, you know, it, it, you can't just throw out a generic answer to this yeah. because yeah. there are details right. that are important. J Jason, can I also add ministries like yeah. Behold Israel and Olive Tree, they're not replacing the church. We are exactly, as far as I am concerned, we're exactly in the niche of adding that which the church is not giving to you if you are in those yeah. type of churches. Yeah. But we will, I will never try to tell someone, hey, you don't need to go to a church. You just stick to uh, you know, listening to us. No, no, no. <laughs> in fact, if your pastor, just like Pastor Barry said, if you, if you study the rest of your Bible um, in a great way to stay there and you can be fed uh, by conferences like that, that that you know we do and Bible teaching that we release and stuff like that. Even this roundtable uh, that is well attended today by thousands of thousands of people all around the world is for that purpose. But do yeah. not forsake the assembly. It is important. Right. 
It is important. Do not turn into a zombie sitting in front of the computer <laughs> and turn that into a church. This is not healthy at all. Yeah. Yeah, and well, and that's a great that's a great point because uh, one of the first questions that actually came in today is from Annalise, and she's in Denmark. And this question really um, it didn't it didn't sadden me inside because of something she did, but the fact that she even had to ask this, I think, is very telling. And she says, "Is it safer not to go to church in order to not be deceived? It is hard to find a good church where I am." Uh, mm -hmm. My family is from Denmark. My wife's family is from Denmark. And I agree with uh, the fact that in Scandinavia, it's very hard to find a church that teaches the Bible. It's very, very hard. But pray hard and you'll find someone that does it. And uh, you, you'll see. I mean, to stay home and not going to church at all sometimes might even be worse. Um, but I do want to tell you something, Jason. If the Bible is not being taught in that church, then don't go. Because yeah. the whole idea of going to church is fellowship around the Word of God, not about uh, some noble ideas of friendships and, uh, and uh, you know, good coffee. Um, mm -hmm. And so church is all about fellowship of the saints around the word of God and the spirit of God. And so we have to, if that's not there, then obviously there's nothing for you to do there. But, uh, you know, this is it. And I, I do feel for her. I know what's going on in Scandinavia. Personally, I know. Thank you. And Annalise, thanks for your transparency in asking that question, because I, don't, I know you're not the only one who, who feels like that. And uh, um, someone did ask really quick, uh, I believe it's an ax somewhere. I just don't know which chapter. They just asked where, for a reminder in the scriptures where it says to be like the Bereans, uh, where, where the Bereans went home to see if what Paul was saying was true. Where, where is that? Well, it's in the book of Acts, if I'm not mistaken, chapter 16. Um, I'll tell you in a sec, but it's, it's one of my uh, uh, absolutely favorite thing because um, you, well, I've got my Hebrew Bible here, so I only can hope that uh, the Hebrew Bible and the, uh, so here it is. So I'm chapter, uh, uh, here it is. So uh, mm -hmm. we go to chapter so Berea is 17, chapter 17, verse 10, okay? Right after Thessaloniki, they went down to the Berea. And about the Berea and the whole, the whole thing is Acts 17 from verse 10 to verse 15. Now, of course, I've got the, uh, the Hebrew one, so uh, I don't know. Barry, in your English one, is it the same? Same verses? Yeah, 17, 10. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, on there down to uh, 11 and beyond. Yep. Yeah, they were more fair-minded than those in yep. Thessaloniki. There you go. They searched the scriptures to find out if the things that Paul said uh, were so. Amen. Okay. Well, yeah, thank you for looking that up. Someone was asking, and I just wanted to be able to give that. And we have we have four minutes left, and I think this— Can I just raise one issue? Please. Um, oh, yes. Please. Please. Uh, going back to the things we, were, we opened with— um, uh, the sensational kind of illustrations we used. And I think another one that some teachers have glommed onto is um, trying to name the Antichrist oh. or name, name the false prophet. Um, and then we get even sillier and or name you know, the suddenly, two witnesses. Name, which which <laughs> a mirror is a part of the two a witnesses. And... According to someone in Minneapolis, because uh, it was my conference, or uh, is it Jared Kushner because his building is labeled 666 uh, in New York City? So, I mean, these these are, it's intriguing to consider Emmanuel Macron as the potential antichrist is intriguing, but it leads us down a pathway that's very unsound. And then, and pretty soon we're going to start listing off all the people who could be the, and Pope Francis is for sure the false prophet. And again, that might draw viewers and you might your numbers might go higher. Quite frankly, whenever I do a radio program on Pope Francis, yeah. the numbers go through the roof, absolutely through the roof, mm. uh, which is good. And we, we try to be balanced, but you can see how it can go haywire. Yeah. 
And also stuff like uh, there was a rabbi that came to the Western Wall on Passover. Yes, yes, yes. Everybody made him the Messiah. Yeah, but, but right. No one in Israel heard about him as the Messiah, just so you know. Yeah. Even the people that were around him, they referred to him as a very holy rabbi. They called him rabbi. Okay. It was all about a rabbi. But from some reason, somebody decided <laughs> this is the Jewish Messiah that is revealed in the Jerusalem. And, you, you know, you get thousands of thousands of viewers. And then they ask me, and I'm always the one that is destroying the party. I'm also the one that had to give them the bad news that it was not what they thought it is. So I'm sorry if I did that. But this is it, guys. Um, we need to clean after so many people that are, are reckless and careless in the way they report things. And it's only pure sensationalism, nothing nothing more than that. Yeah, it's uh, I. I remember just a couple of months ago, I was asked some questions by another church because people in the congregation were hearing certain things as similar to what you've just voiced. And I remember you said the same thing to me. You said, I'm always having to clean up this stuff when it comes out of Israel. I'm always having to clean up this mess. Yeah. Well, at uh, least when it comes to Israel, but you know, you, you guys have to clean up uh, after the stuff that is being said about the U S so. That's <laughs> yeah. um, well, we have one minute, so really quick in closing, uh, Amir, do you think, Kimberly asks, could we see a revival and a great falling away at the same time? And I, I, I think that's an interesting question because I think what's important to remember is that they're not overnight events, but can we see over yeah. time that these yeah. take place? Jason, the, the great falling away is promised in the scriptures. We don't, it's not could, we will see, we see it already. Yeah. Now, regarding revival, every one of us should pray for it. We always need to pray for it. We, it's something that we have to pray for in order for many more people to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. But to tell you that I know for sure there's going to be a great revival, I cannot. I mean, honestly, I cannot. I wish I knew where and when and how. I, I pray that more people will have their eyes open. I pray that there will be some some event that will cause people to fall on their face and say, you know, Lord, okay, but um, I don't see a specific scripture that says before Jesus is going to take the church, there's going to be a great revival. There is no such verse that I can hang on to, uh, but, but again, that's what we always need to pray for, that more and more and more people will be saved and and that God will use us if if he can to you know share those good news with the people. Yeah. That's it. Good. Guys, I want to thank you Jason for uh doing that for us. Um I want to thank everybody. Look, I know I offended, we all offended many of you. I could see it on the on the uh but it's okay. We're here for that. That's our job. Uh, <laughs> Um, thank you, Jason. I would like to, um, Jan, I want to tell people how they can get in touch with you. This is how you can find Jan Markel online. Here it is. And um, if you want to know how you can get a hold of Barry Stagner, And regarding us, behold Israel, this is it. And I would uh, be blessed uh, if, Jan, you can close in prayer and uh, as sure. we conclude this, okay? Okay. Uh, Father, we just, uh, we thank, I thank you that everyone here and many listening and watching today do have a love for the truth. And they have a love for the word and they have a love for finding truth inside the Bible and for avoiding things that are distractions for the sensational, for the supernatural. Uh, God, I just pray that you'd make us balanced believers. Mm -hmm. if, if that's sort of the one message of this hour is that we would all be balanced in what we believe and what we teach. And uh, we, we pray that your return would be, well, 
perhaps even today, I mean, uh, that would be a great encouragement as our times get darker and darker. And again, we thank you that we know the light of the world, even in spite of the darkness. Amen. And we ask all these things in, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 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 I want to thank everybody for watching this with us. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Pastor Barry. Thank you, Jan. And thank you. Um, we will be back in a couple weeks with another Prophecy Roundtable. We'll let you know which topic is going to be. We love this thing. It's a great chance for us to tackle things that are right. burning things uh, within the hearts of so many believers. Uh, continue to be in touch with us via emails. Uh, um, you, you all saw the emails uh, of the different ministries. Thank you. God bless you. And shalom. Yeah. Galilee. Shalom. Bye-bye. Shalom. Bye -bye. Shalom.